Listen well while I tell you a story Of a boy and a girl in the spring As the first flower burst into glory And I heard every bird start to sing Papa, he loves mama. <laughs> mama, she loves papa. It's really hard to explain what it was like growing up in the 50s and 60s. For example, there were a lot of jobs that women just couldn't have. We were conditioned to be servants to men. You sucked up to men, of course you did, because they were the meal ticket. <laughs> All of us were hijacked, you know, we were hijacked in this kind of like domestic nightmare. In the 1960s, a movement for women's rights exploded in Australia. All of a sudden, these gates of enlightenment burst open and we thought, well, hang on, what's going on? This is a long-range pr program to break down the moral standards of the community. What you're seeing is a revolution in the making. It redefined the role of women in society and radically changed the lives of all Australians. It was so recent that the women weren't allowed to vote. And a lot of women still don't realise that only a few years ago, relatively speaking, women actually had to leave the public service to look after their husbands as soon as they got married. History has to be told over and over again because people forget. And unless it's retold, it's lost. When I grew up in the 1960s, the common understanding was that a woman's place was in the home. Her main role was to be a wife and a mother. Women had very limited options in what work they could do and even where they could go. In Queensland, it was actually illegal for women to drink in a public bar with men. But times were changing and some women, like my mother, were determined to shake up Australia. I just thought, how can there be this distortion of English that says something's public and means that there will be no women in it? To draw attention to the issue, Merle and her friend Rosalie Bogner chained themselves to the bar of the Regatta Hotel. We'd certainly planned to get some interest in the issue, but the degree of attention was a complete surprise. I was probably only six, but I do remember being allowed to stay up to watch Four Corners, which had a very, you know, quite an in-depth report on this incident. We do think it's an important and significant issue, both in being a matter of legal discrimination against women, which is never trivial, but always invidious. These sorts of things would have been kept from us, of course, as children, but there were death threats against mum. They felt really threatened. It was going to ruin their lives to have women in the bar. In my view, and in the view of most thinking males, we still regard them as the gentler sex that uh, we should protect. Mr Minister, when do you think women will no longer need to be protected? I don't think ever. <laughs> After the protest, Mum and Roe formed an organisation called Equal Opportunities for Women. Their actions taught me that women could be powerful if they spoke up, and especially if they joined with others. The urgent issue for women around Australia was equal pay. Most women worked in the lowest paid jobs that men didn't do, or they did the same work as men but were only paid 75% of a man's wage. In 1969, decades of campaigning for equal pay finally culminated in a national wage case to challenge the rulings for women workers. Part of that campaign that I got involved in was being with the women from the meatworks to go to the arbitration court and sit and listen to the case. And I thought, here are all the women, here we are, all sitting here, as if we haven't got a brain in our bloody heads as if we're incapable of speaking for ourselves on how much we think we're worth, 
and here are all these men arguing about how much we're worth and all men are going to make the decision. And I found the whole experience to be humiliating and, and very demeaning. And I came away feeling terribly angry and frustrated. The result of the case was devastating because only 12% of the women in the industry finished up with equal pay. I realised something drastic had to happen. We had to do something outlandish and very unladylike. And I went in my lunch hour and chained myself up across the doors of the Commonwealth Building. I saw the photo of Zelda in the paper chained up and I thought I should be there with her um, I, because I was really, really annoyed at that 1969 decision. But I thought, OK, I'll give her a ring and see if she's crazy or not. <laughs> so we met and we got on really well. I said, look, if you're going to have any more demonstrations, then I'd be interested. And then I talked to Thelma and she was interested too. So about three weeks, I think, after Zelda chained herself, then the three of us chained ourselves to the Arbitration Commission building. And then we decided that we would form a Women's Action Committee. We thought we were the only group, you know, for a little while. And then gradually we started hearing about people in the universities. Mostly they seemed to be connected with some sort of socialist party. And they're a lot younger than us, too. I was very involved in the anti-conscription and anti-war movement on campus at Monash. It was just this ferment of things happening all the time, all the time. We were all involved in the anti-war movement and we were all pulling our weight in the movement. This is something that somebody from economics could do. None of the economics... I was in the Labor Club. And I was noticing that the women never spoke, the women handed out the leaflets, the women did all the support work, but they never took these sort of leadership speaking roles. People come in with a place already going and instead of it closing at 5 p.m. or 9... You know, it was still left to the women to do the washing up, to do the menial tasks, to look admiringly while they spoke. Australian troops! Late 1968, early 1969, we started to hear about this thing called the Women's Liberation Movement that was developing in the States. We started to talk about it amongst ourselves. I mean, it was putting into words what we'd all been feeling. That was just so exciting. We decided to have a public meeting and declare women's liberation, you know, a real going concern. And so we decided on the 14th of January, we handed out our flyers for the meeting and we waited to see who would come. We were so naive politically that we didn't realise that you don't have public meetings in January. Nobody's around, they're all on holidays, but still they came. It was packed. It was absolutely packed. There would have been, I'm sure, over a hundred. There was hardly room for people to fit in. I went along to that meeting really angry, really angry. This rubbish about women, what on earth were they thinking? You know, Vietnam was what mattered. But I felt like I got hit in the solar plexus with a sledgehammer. I just went, oh my God, that's what, that's how I've lived my life. And and that means I think being a woman's terrible. I hate being a woman. So it, I was just like this incredible conversion experience <laughs> that, that was in my body, in my mind. The girls of the Women's Liberation Group are organising themselves. Discovering women's liberation was sort of a, a revelation to me, really. It made a lot of sense of a lot of things about which I was angry. Jill, do Australian women really need liberating? Um, perhaps not all Australian women feel they do, but I think most of them would. There are some women who feel, I'm all right now, I'm fairly liberated, I've got a job, um, I'm not the conventional housewife, I'm not tied down. 
but in fact they're probably having trouble getting childcare facilities, in fact they're doing two jobs at once. Very few men particularly take it very seriously, think it's, it's a bit trivial, um, it really doesn't matter, that we'll get over it and so on. <laughs> um, I think they're wrong. The hardest pill to swallow was the lack of support from the male left. When we were not listened to and when we were put down, many of us became very angry. We were all at a boil. Nobody would listen to us. So we had to do something. The women demanded the right to speak at a moratorium against the Vietnam War. Kate Jennings wrote a confronting speech and mustered the courage to deliver it. Kate had this Indian floral dress. She looked so fragile. And Kate, in her floral frock, stood up and made one of the most sensational speeches. It suits you to keep women in the kitchen and in underpaid menial jobs. Under your veneer, you are brothers to the pig politicians. You'll say I'm a man-hating, bra-burning, lesbian member of the castration penis envy brigade, which I am. Her rage was just palpable, and it was like this wind that just went through the crowd. It was incredible. And I say to every woman that every time you're put down or fucked over, tell them to go suck their own cock. All power to women. It was an extraordinarily frightening moment in some ways. I remember Martha Kay, where she had something in her hands, like I was hoping it was a stick or something, because there was this feeling, there was this feeling of danger. The men in the audience started yelling, you belong on your back, you ugly bitch. Pretty violent comments. And in that moment, quite a few women became feminists, just like that. The women were kind of rising up and saying, you know, no, no more. You know, we're, we're not just doing the sandwiches and the tea. You know, we're, we're not just the bedfellows. We are a movement and we're in our own right. I think a lot of the leadership of the male left were really outraged because they were so self-righteous. And they were good comrades in that sense. They were activists, but it had never occurred to them that they were assholes. You know, it's like, this is what happens. It's like colonialism, it's like racism. You don't necessarily carry the image of yourself that someone else does, and it's deeply shocking when you are called for, for your actions. What threatens men so much about women's well, liberation? I think men feel that somehow women's liberation is a threat to their manhood. And it is, it really is a threat to their manhood because their manhood is phony. What do you think a woman's role should be then? <laughs> um, basically, uh, Charles the Baron housekeeper. Yeah, yeah, the pregnant and barefooted image in the homes and off the streets. Sort the of, things sort of we of, can't do. These women liberationists trying to change our system. You know? Just looking at history, she's always had this role and they haven't before ever tried to, to change it. Well, it seems to me that what you're really saying is that you men are superior in every way to all women. Um, Pretty well, that's putting it very simplistically, but basically, yeah. was married to an Australian rugby union player whom I met at UCLA. I had four kids under six. And these two women met me and said, Psst, do you want to come to a meeting? <laughs> I said, oh, yes. And that was my first women's meeting. For three months, I didn't know a single person's name because people couldn't be bothered with names. We were just women on fire. In lounge rooms across Australia, consciousness-raising meetings were thriving. 
It's very important. I think it all starts really with an individual sort of awakening. Sometime in your, in your life when you're growing up, you know, it comes through to you all the time that you're inferior, you're, you're oppressed some way or another. And I'm sure every woman here has gone through this. I know I have. And you start really thinking, you know, you get terribly introspective and think, look, you know, there must be something wrong with me. I can't adapt to this society. I'm, I'm strange, I'm queer, I'm odd. Yeah, why should it be prescribed for women to be feminine and I think for men we should to be masculine? We should define what is feminine before yeah, we even start yeah. discussing it. Because when you look at it, it turns out to be not at all what you sus mm. suspect it is. It's mm. something quite different. Mm. No, I think it's, you know, completely superficial, hair, face, um, clothes and mannerisms. You know? I think it's more than superficial. Mm. I think it's a whole way of relating to other people, specifically men, not fighting for what you want, sort of always, you know, sort of bowing down and serving. You know, sort of this great martyrdom. Uh, femininity is, I guess, a great pointless martyrdom. We discussed our lives and we drew from our own lives the wider picture. One of the first things it did, it involved learning to trust other women. And that was something we'd never done. Your main job in life was to find a good husband and, and if every other woman was a potential competitor for the available good men. This whole approach of using consciousness raising, that is uh, realising that what you have come to accept as, you, as a normalised state isn't, you go past that and you realise that what's happening to you is happening to others. This is a huge step. I don't know, just that, I mean, we don't know what a, what a liberated woman is. I mean, there's no such thing, so there's not sort of a stereotype that we're working to. I guess it boils down that I'm angriest at myself for sort of being conned for all these years, you know, into sort of accepting a, a kind of an image of myself that now I think is invalid. I'm in women's liberation for one reason. I'm really a very quiet person, but I am very, very angry. And I'm angry because of what's happening to me and what's happening to my sisters. And every woman should know what I'm talking about. We're really on a roller coaster of, of, of learning and understanding and, and awareness. And, and you know, just being confronted with all these new ideas and new ways of thinking of things. And there was Jermaine Greer's book, The Female Eunuch, which you know, took the world by storm. Everybody now knows that there's something called women's liberation. A lot of people think they know what it is, and they don't. But a great many more people think that they perhaps better find out. I was so excited so much of the time and just thinking, 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 coming up with ideas. We were always putting out our underground papers and our flyers and our leaflets. You know, there was Vashti's voice in Melbourne, there was me, Jane, in Sydney, there was Hecate in Brisbane. This was our way of trying to discuss things, understand things and tell people about things. The movement got bigger and bigger and it reached out to all sorts of places. It was not a top-down thing, it was a bushfire, it was a grass fire. It spread in small groups. The momentum that built up gradually in 70, we couldn't believe it. And it just grew and grew and grew, and it was, it was what we'd always wanted. All the theatre groups were starting to happen, and the film groups were starting to happen, and the whole thing started to really become very, very um, uh, turbulent. The momentum and energy, I think, came from the incredible feeling of working with other women. OK, there was anger, but also this sort of joy of finding out, having the scales taken from the eyes. The fact that there was somebody beside you, man, if you didn't feel you could do it well, the two of you could do it together. One of the first things we did was to pinch in down George Street, where we walked down the main street of Sydney, pinching men's bottoms. It's really agitprop, isn't it? By doing this stuff out in public, people noticed us. I was involved in some of the pub crawls for women into public bars. We'd be a band of maybe up to 10, and there'd be a full, enormous public bar of men. We were always nervous before those sorts of actions.
the Women and Trade Union Conference focused us on the, the left and you know, on the, the real dilemmas of who, who would support us. Men had locked us out and we were able to force open the doors and we got into the foyer. We had this instruction that we should grab delegates and interrogate them. And so I thought, oh, a delegate grabbed, and grabbed him, this poor guy. And I said, and what's your union doing for women? And I looked down and his badge said that he was from the Undertaker's Union. Well, that was the end of it. <laughs> I lost it totally. I think he laughed too. Women's liberation was seen as such a threat to the nation that the movement was put under surveillance by ASIO. Here I am with my parents at 12 years old holding a women's liberation flag, possibly my earliest screen role, though of course I had no idea at the time. It was really funny because the ASIO people wore pink suits. Now it sounds very strange, but it was a sort of dusty, palish pink. And I'd be giving out leaflets, you know, and you'd look and you'd see all these pink trousers and I'd look up and say, oh, the boys are here, and hand out the pamphlets, you know. I'm a girl watcher, I'm a girl watcher, watching girls go by, my, my, my. I'm a girl watcher, I'm a girl watcher, here comes one now. The act of women getting together can be revolutionary because it means that women break the silence that keeps them and st keeps them in their place. I think the women's movement and the women's health movement, which was central to it, were completely rethinking the role of women in society and family and, and in the workforce from the ground up. They're called the <coughs> reproductive organs. You can say it, can't you? Say it with me, girls. The reproductive organs. Good girls. In a patriarchal society, women were alienated from their own bodies. We didn't know what our bodies looked like, even. Women had, hadn't looked at their vaginas before. They, it, that was the hidden part. So we were into, well, let's have a look. Women were determined to find out how to, to get sexual pleasure. I have women friends who've told me that they've had a whole entire married life and never had one orgasm with their husband. The sexual revolution was starting and sex was okay for men but not women, or maybe it was okay for women if you didn't get caught. I guess my policy was to only sleep with blokes I loved enough to be happy to marry if, if I got pregnant. We are just starting to be sexually active, although the pill wasn't really available yet. It was, I think it was starting to be available for married women, but most of us didn't have the pill unless we had boyfriends who were doctors or something. So getting pregnant was a constant fear. I was deeply, well, as much as you can be deeply in love at 18, I mean, what is love? But I was completely in love with the, the guy uh, that I was pregnant to. He didn't want to have the baby. I couldn't tell my parents. So here am I, age 18 in Melbourne, can't get an abortion, you have to fly to Sydney, you have to have your 300 pounds or whatever it was in a brown paper envelope and put it under a door in Macquarie Street and then go to a clinic where the abortions are done at night because the police might raid the clinics. Really, it was a deeply traumatising experience having an abortion when they were illegal. 
When something is criminalised, you inevitably inherit the shame of the fact that it's regarded as a criminal act. So it's when I met the women in the women's liberation movement, abortion was actually one of the campaigns that we started organising around for women to control their own bodies, for women to have full decision making over what they did with, you know, not the church, not the state, women must de decide our fate. That was our chant. Not the church, not the state, women must decide their fate, not the church, not the The abortion state. issue became hugely controversial and at Glebe we were right in the thick of all of this. There were the phone calls, the endless phone calls, and then there were meeting trains late at night with young teenage pregnant girls coming from the country and having to look after them. And, you know, there was nothing. There was no support system of any kind. If there's not decent, safe medical abortion, then women find a way to do it, and they put their lives at risk. They use poisons, they use terrible metal instruments, like, that's the issue. The issue was so contentious that thousands gathered to hear a debate on abortion and contraception, featuring Jermaine Greer as the keynote speaker. I would like to address my remarks to the man who said he was a Catholic father of nine and is happy. I have had eight children in ten years, one hysterectomy, one rectus seal, one sister seal, and two varicose vein operations, and I'm not happy. A lot of us had been put under a lot of pressure not to become single mothers. So once we were pregnant, there's a lot of pressure to abort, a lot of pressure to adopt. So when my boyfriend was killed in a car accident, on his way to talk to my parents about getting married, oddly enough, it was the most dreadful afternoon, you know, I remember getting the phone call. There's been a crash and Bill's been killed. Wow, you know. I remember just going and lying on the spare bed and thinking, if I'm pregnant, you know, I could have an abortion and things would be back the way they were. And I just thought, I don't want them to be back the way they were, you know. I'll go ahead. I remember thinking, if Greer can campaign to have to give women the right to choose an um, abortion, then maybe we can also do the same thing for single mothers. I went through the mill of the women's hospital and social work department, getting told if you keep your baby, you'll end up in the gutter, and if you love your baby, you'll give, you'll give the baby up for adoption to a nice adoptive family. She said things like, women like you are undermining the institution of marriage. I said, but I wanted to be married. We were going to get married. And she said, well, if he'd cared about you, he wouldn't have left you like this. Really vicious stuff. There was no pension for single mothers at that stage. It was full on survival mode. It was really scary because you had to juggle accommodation, work and childcare. Rosemary decided to set up a group to campaign for financial assistance for single mothers and the right to keep their children. And we had 11 women turn up. I remember thinking, this, you know, we can start the revolution with this. This'll do. In 1972, there was a groundswell of rebellion. Disenfranchised communities were demanding change. We have scored a political victory here today. The embassy has been re-erected and has been standing now for almost more than three hours. Gough Whitlam was already on the rise as the leader of the Labour Party. The Conservative Party, under Billy McMahon, was facing the possibility of defeat. Now, after 23 years of uninterrupted government, the Conservative Coalition faces the people as the underdog in all the pre-election polls. No one will really know until the night of December 2. Gary Scully reporting from Canberra. With the election in her sights, Political activist Beatrice Faust came up with a brilliant plan to put women's issues on the agenda. 
she enlisted a group of professional women to undertake a nationwide survey of every political candidate on their attitudes to women. They called themselves the Women's Electoral Lobby, or WELL, and it wasn't long before thousands of women were joining chapters across the country. This was different to the consciousness raising um, and the more radical women's liberation. It was about practical legislative reforms that governments could do. So far, only one non-party organisation, the Women's Electoral Lobby, or WEL, has made any attempt to specifically influence the female vote. These are the mobilised forces of WELL. The domestic setting belies the conviction of the members as they set out to crack the cosy male chauvinism of Australian politics. Are you right? Yes. <laughs> At what age should contraceptive advice be available to one boys and two girls? Politicians had never been asked about their views about women's roles. It was quite extraordinary, which is why we got banner headlines in all the newspapers. And they came out with the most extraordinarily bad answers. The Prime Minister, Billy McMahon, got a score of one out of 40. And the reason he got one was because to most of the questions he seemed have no idea what they're talking about. He said, oh, why don't you ask my secretary? The leader of the opposition, Gough Whitlam, got 33 out of 40. We were able to convince the deputy editor from The Age to produce a form guide, like the racing guide, where the horses were lined up. Since 1949, we're having a Labour government. The survey had a big impact on the election results, and the new government took on board many of the issues Well had raised. Within two days, the equal pay case was reopened, and the decision was made to give women equal pay for work of equal value. And the new government took another bold step. In a world first, they created the position of women's advisor to the prime minister. When this job was advertised, it was like a clarion call. It was like, hey, you guys out there fighting each other over whether what you're on about is reform versus revolution. Why don't you come into this arena and see if you can formulate those policies that are needed? I just felt we had a moral obligation to answer the call. We suddenly realised that we had some responsibilities. If, if, the, if the Prime Minister is saying, what can I do to make the lives of women better? Um, you can't say, well, you know, we need orgasms. You know, you, I mean, you can, but you also, be, we've got an opportunity to get, to get some practical stuff done. So we had to think, OK, what the hell do we really want? That was a tricky moment for me, and, and in me, Jane, too, because at the point before the appointment, it seemed most important to raise the issues, to actually say, what are the implications here? I didn't like the idea that we were being somehow siphoned into a department and through an individual woman that the government would choose in order to decide on what would happen with our issues. The Me Jane Collective felt very strongly that to enter the halls of government was in itself a compromising act. <laughs> that our role was to be out in the streets yelling and screaming and demanding not to sleep with our oppressors. While the position was ridiculed in the media and many debated its worth, some were beginning to question whether they belonged in the movement at all. Lesbians in the women's movement were seen as a hindrance to women being able to achieve reforms because lesbians were not seen as being socially acceptable, therefore the whole women's movement could be characterised as lesbians and be dismissed by society. The issue came to a head at a National Women's Liberation Conference in Victoria. We decided this was the time for us to sort of launch 
uh, a full-on offensive and we wrote a paper called Sexism in the Women's Movement. We gave that paper, it was very difficult at first and it was also terrifying. They were singling out behaviour that they found offensive within the movement. It was something that we all had to ask ourselves, is that me? We didn't know where it was going to lead us in terms of our own lives, in terms of our own sexuality. It felt dangerous in some ways, emotionally and, and politically dangerous. The women's movement was being accused of the very thing they were fighting, discrimination. I was the first Aboriginal law graduate in the country. When I first came to Sydney and started to get involved with women's groups, I found a lot of them, frankly, really racist. I mean, and unconscious racism. If I had confronted them, they'd have denied it. I couldn't understand why they couldn't see themselves. But they'd never really had contact with Aboriginal people. There's no question but there's a huge gulf between the women's, the white women's movement and the struggles of Indigenous women. I wrote a, an article about racism amongst white women and that set some of their feathers ruffling. But it had to be said. And for that matter, I think it still has to be said. Um, it takes a long time for those. It's like sexism. Mm. It takes a long time to get rid of those deeply embedded attitudes. What can we as individuals do? Well, well, you you are educate your own white people about our problem, our struggle. Yeah. Well, we can't afford to educate white people at the moment about the blacks here in Australia. We're too busy trying to educate our own people about what's happening. A lot of Aboriginal women just didn't get involved with white women's... Well, it was seen as white women's liberation. Because I think that white women saw Aboriginal women as being in the same boat as them. And that was the problem. There was that... They thought Aboriginal women were in the same boat as them and that we should be in their boat too. But, of course, that, it wasn't like that. When you start moving, you know, getting out of the oppression that you've been under, and the men start wanting to assert themselves, you think you have to then hold back, step back, and let them go for, forward first, or what? Well, I believe that a black woman's place is behind her man. And this is why woman liberation, you know, just... And you women just talk about liberating uh, women, want to liberate yourselves, while uh, there's the blacks are going through violence every day of their lives. And you just talk about uh, women's liberation. You, know, you, you know, know, everyone, everyone has, has to liberate themselves. themselves. Blacks have to liberate themselves. We, yeah, can't, we can't, can't liberate you. you. And that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to say to you. We can't afford a split at the moment. Meanwhile, in Canberra, Philosophy tutor Elizabeth Reed topped the shortlist to become the first advisor on women's affairs. But first, she would have to be approved by the Prime Minister. One of the things that the Canberra Women's Minister did to raise money was to print this underwear that had the women's lip sign on the crotch. So come the time to meet the Prime Minister, I decided, OK, uh, that, that's what I'm going to wear. I'm going to wear my outward shield. That's long Laura Ashley dress. But underneath it, I will have my women's in pants. And that's what will give me courage. After the interview, I remember I went back to the staff club and I think that at one stage, I got up on top of the piano and said, I've just been interviewed for this job. And have a look at what I was wearing to protect me. <laughs> Elizabeth Reed is 33, country born, a teacher's daughter, philosophy honours graduate, divorcee, part time mother. You ready to roll, Eric? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's make sure our cameras are rolling, Jimmy. Uh, oh, you're right. Would you describe yourself as a women's liberationist? 
if you could tell me what that what you meant by it. Well, I mean, you disagree with marriage, and as I understand it, you uh, only just tolerate children. Oh, on the contrary, I don't disagree with marriage, and I love children. And the press start asking me questions like, what do you think about homosexuality or abortion or drugs? Both the men and the women. Don't... The next day, I looked at the papers, I couldn't believe. were titillated, even the female press were titillated by this. There's this woman who is going to work as a women's advisor to the Prime Minister. The practice of conscience raising had taught me to listen to other women. And so I travelled around Australia talking to women. Women in jail, women in farms, women in schools, women everywhere. So we mustn't underestimate that sort of social fact. Government has neglected women. Justice on the whole, various other parts of society have neglected women. Women started writing and they started pouring out their problems in this. You know, I can't get a loan for my house, I can't even sign my children's forms. And it didn't take long before I was getting more letters than, than anybody else other than the Prime Minister. There was no such thing as a woman's policy, so everything, all those letters, formed the basis of policy development. If we get a yes vote in, in the referendum, Having a women's advisor at the federal level overseeing all the papers that came into the Prime Minister's office and looking at the impact that those policies would have on women was the first. No one had ever thought of that before. And that was a major, major advance. I'll now hand over to Elizabeth Reid. Thank you. While Elizabeth worked within the system, women around Australia were confronting the reality of violence in their day-to-day -day lives. Linda Ryan and I used to share a house in um, Annandale. We were there at home one night and we heard this banging on our back door. We opened the door and there was this young girl with a baby and she had climbed over the fence because her husband was chasing her with a knife. And well, just, it was my first confrontation with the terror. And, and of domestic violence and of, of what a woman, the fact that this woman could get over this fence at all, let alone carrying a baby, just shocked us to the core. One of the big moments, I guess, in the women's movement in Sydney was we had a, what we used to call the Women's Commission. I've got another building. Anyone could stand up and speak, but the topic was violence and it was, you know, very. Uh, tentative at first because you know people were scared to speak and eventually more and more women would get up and they would basically testify to what had happened to them and it was the most unbelievable experience for everybody because we all suddenly went you know this woman that you'd known for or you know, get, gets up and talks about her rape. People I knew got up and talked about how they're on the abortionist table about to have the abortion and and the doctor the so-called doctor raped them and that was when we realised that violence was a huge part of our lives and something that all of us had experienced but none of us ever talked about. Women could not leave abusive marriages because they had no money. They had no money and nowhere to go. I heard about this woman in London called Erin Pitsy who ran a women's shelter and she'd published a book called Scream Quietly or the Neighbours Will Hear. So I rang her and said, well, how do you do it? She said, just do it, do it. Six weeks ago, the women's liberation movement squatted in these two derelict houses owned by the Church of England. It was illegal, but the clear need for a secular shelter to house dispossessed and frightened women and their children forced the move. We tried for about five months to obtain a place by legitimate means, and every offer was either refused or was delayed for so long that uh, we felt we couldn't wait any longer. Elsie was Australia's first women's refuge. It was completely run by volunteers in the women's movement. Before long, refuges and rape crisis centres were set up right across the country. 
I was just terrified of dying and I knew that I had to act in a way so as to not antagonise him so that I wouldn't die. Yeah. I knew what I had to do, my mind was... We started to talk about rape as being about power, not about sex so much as about power. Feminism gave us an understanding of where we sat within the, the power structure and it made us angry. And there was a lot of anger. It was a revolution. And people who make revolutions get burnt and hurt and distorted, go a bit crazy, all sorts of things happen, but it's also completely exhilarating. You're just carried away. Until now, the world has been run by men. Men have been able to leave their children behind because they've got wives slaving away as their servants, looking after their children. Now, the world's going to change. We're going to have to acknowledge the fact that women exist, they menstruate, they have children, and institutions will start just having to accommodate to them because we don't have slaves at home to stay behind, ironing our shirts and looking after our children. It was enormous, the march that year, just enormous. Within five years, women all over are seeing what before was unseeable and questioning what was unquestionable and wanting to take charge of their lives. Putting pressure on the government had already achieved huge reforms for women. Millions of dollars had been granted for community health centres in every state, anti-discrimination legislation was underway for women in the workplace, and a new benefit for single mothers was created. It just felt absolutely amazing. <laughs> the attitudes changed, so it wasn't just the fact that you had a pension, it was that people weren't being bullied into giving up their babies anymore. Young women could now keep the child if they wanted to. A small change like that was radical in this impact. But the changes were happening too quickly for some. Excuse me, Prime Minister. Do you have any comment on Mr Bowen, sir? The Whitlam government was accused of financial mismanagement and fierce opposition was growing. The press was hostile. It was hostile to anything that the Whitlam government did, but particularly about women. Canberra is playing host this week to almost a 1,000 women from all over the country in the Women in Politics Conference being held by the federal government as a contribution to International Women's Year. It was an amazing time. It's just amazing. And it was a time of tension, a time of conflict. There's absolutely no doubt. Woman has a right to be a family woman if she wants to do so. She shouldn't feel embarrassed and have to apologise for being just a housewife. I know, for instance, National Women here, they set up a committee. I think there is one migrant woman from Melbourne. We migrant women from Sydney are absolutely unrepresented. So I'm afraid Miss Elizabeth Reed might be a very nice girl, but she's not very popular with migrant girls. Monday conference tonight, live from Canberra, Women and Politics, the goals and strategy for the future. We sat around here today and listened to people talking about women's oppression. But the most oppressed people in this country is the black women, then the black men, and then way above us is a white woman. She's got everything that we haven't got. Uh, I'd like to know why, if we're to be liberated, it was necessary on the part of the organisers to condition, brainwash and even stir women to aggression and coercion. <laughs> is it not true that your liberation is nothing more nor less than a political tool of Marxism? <laughs> We designed this so that 
there was no one voice. There were meant to be multiple voices from multiple positions speaking multiple different things. But it was presented in the press as just one more talk fest among women. There was a feeling of being besieged. The unrest continued into the evening where the Prime Minister had been invited to address the conference. It is, however, our responsibility, the responsibility of you, the women of Australia, and of us, your government. You had Aboriginal women who gathered outside and walked in, stormed in while he was speaking uh, about the Aboriginal policies. Women are in politics. They know how to organise. And then you had the radical lesbians who were painting the st you know, hanging bras on statues in the King's Hall and painting lesbians are lovely on the mirrors in the men's toilets. So the press, who had already trivialised the conference beyond belief, they just had an absolute heyday with this. The press was not interested in anything to do with women unless there was a cat fight. It just became too much for Elizabeth. The demands on her were enormous. I was called into the Prime Minister's office the day after, and there were all these men in the room, and they held up all of these press headlines about lesbians are lovely and bras on the statue of King George III and so on and so forth. And, and, and they said, they turned to the Prime Minister, they said, You've got, she's got to go, she's got to go. Eventually they brought the Prime Minister down and he agreed. And they offered me a position in the bureaucracy, which of course I wasn't going to take. I'd been speaking with the trust of the Prime Minister. I had no aim to become a bureaucrat. And so I resigned. I issued a press statement. My family came in. We stripped my office bare and, and I got on the plane and went to the wilds of Canada to nurse my exhaustion, probably. <laughs> Women protested in support of Elizabeth Reed, but an even bigger surprise was just around the corner. Political sensation in the national capital. Prime Minister Mr. Whitlam has been sacked. The opposition leader, Mr. Fraser, is the new Prime Minister of Australia. It will be my sole purpose as head of the government to restore responsible management to Australia's affairs and to ensure that Australia has the general election to which it is constitutionally entitled. Women around the country were afraid that Malcolm Fraser would dismantle their hard-won gains, but he would keep most of the initiatives set up under Whitlam. I think the very fact that the Fraser government was just unprepared to take women on and to change, radically change in any way, what we had established shows how much we had filtered down into or out into women's consciousness of the changes and how much they supported them. We are rising in our unclean body It was a decade that changed our lives forever. These exceptional women had seized the moment and radically redefined the role of women in society. Women clearly can change the world because we have. Uh, there's proof. <laughs> When you look back to where things were, you know, just those simple things of women not being allowed in the public bar, battling for equal pay for women, abortion rights, childcare, there's massive change going on. And the biggest success of the movement is that it happened, that we created it. The minds of women have changed. Women's liberation gave us the opportunity to have our voices heard and to be taken seriously. 
in a way that just never seemed possible when I was a teenager. When I see the confidence of young women these days, I just think, yes, yes, you know, fantastic. My children were babies. You would never see a man holding a baby walking down the street. Never. Society in general had not really started to embrace sexual diversity until reasonably recently. Intersex and transgender people weren't even talked about. 50 years ago, it was, you know, you were either gay or you were straight, and that was that. I think it's important for young women today because things don't necessarily keep on improving, and they might find themselves in exactly the same position as we were in if they don't understand and defend the progress that we've made. Within the space of 50 or 60 years, we've changed everything. We haven't changed enough, and there's still a huge um, amount of resistance to be overcome, and some of that's going to be very formidable. Not be lectured about sexism Order. and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. When it comes to male domination, where are the women in parliament, in high-profile jobs, in corporations, where are women then? and they're still not in the numbers. We haven't overcome the issues of male violence and power as we see on a daily basis. There are incomplete things, but we have made huge differences in women's lives. But it really depends on women to continue to stand up for themselves, and in a good way that's inclusive. Women should always band together. Whenever you have a chance, band together. <laughs> because collectively we can be very strong. A small band of people can change the world. And it was a small band. It's not as if it was just government or it just happened, you know. It was a small band of determined people and it spread.